Uh, yeah, a little bit. Live. Like that. Think I of think like what live, she's yeah. doing right now. Saying okay. we're live. Okay. Saying that we're live. Yeah. We got it. Hi, everyone. We're live. <laughs> uh, welcome, friends. We're here on this icy evening at the Montgomery Book Exchange in the village of Montgomery. Thank you, Walt, for hosting us. Uh, we're here with Supervisor Elect Brian Marr and uh, Town Board Council Member Elect Kristen Brown. Um, unfortunately, Ron Feller wasn't able to make it here because of the icy conditions. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Ron. Sorry, we miss Ron. you. We will. We will see you next time. We'll save your questions. <laughs> um, I'm Karina Tipton. Brian asked me to facilitate this conversation. I am the chair of Residents Protecting Montgomery, which is a group of citizens that came together after noticing that there was a lot of development going on and we were starting to see the same faces at every town board meeting speaking up. So we started to meet at our kitchen tables. We made some friendships and we, we kept the momentum going. And now we're a group with hundreds of members who many of them hopefully are watching tonight. So, hi everybody. We did facilitate uh, questions from the community. I collected those electronically over the last few days, week or so, and I did claim editorial privileges. A lot of these questions were very similar to each other, sure. so I combined a lot of them and I, I mashed them all together. So if you did ask a question and you don't hear your exact words coming up, I apologize. I had to combine a bunch of questions. How are we doing, Diane? I want to also thank Diane, who's doing the videoing. She's been a superstar. She if has. you've Yay. had the privilege of <laughs> <laughs> if you've had the privilege of watching any of our town board meetings, planning board meetings, EBA meetings, IDA meetings, village meetings, it's because Diane has been showing up to all of these meetings and just videotaping them as a courtesy to her fellow residents. So thank you, Diane. You is are one of your a questions special be, hero uh, and a wizard. Is one of your questions going to be about back pay for her, for uh, services yeah. rendered at um, town is meetings? That, is that possible? Could we do we'll a see. voucher or something? <laughs> yeah. So uh, there were a lot of questions. I'm going to start out with a softball question because I think a lot of us are just becoming familiar with you now. Could, could each of you tell us where you live in the town and what keeps you staying here in Montgomery? So my family and I have a historic farm on Browns Road. Um, it's 113 acres and we are the fifth generation on the farm, my husband and I. We raise beef cows uh, for freezer meat. So we have customers that individually come to the farm and buy meat. In addition, we also bring cows to the auction a couple times a year. We do roaster chickens, we do eggs, um, all for sale off the farm and we do go to a couple other uh, stores. Um, what keeps us here is our history. I mean, we, we are big into the history of our family because we've been here for so long, dating back to the, the Coldens. And, um, but really, it's our kids. Um, my son is 16 months, and our, who is John, and our daughter is four. Her name is Bailey. And really seeing their enthusiasm on the farm is what keeps us going. And that's how I decided to become involved in politics, is ensuring that our farm has a future in the town of Montgomery for the kids. Awesome. Uh, so you're good really, luck with that. You're really good. You're really good at this. <laughs> Never Kristen. go after Kristen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Brian Marr, born and raised in the village of Walden, uh, and the product of two amazing parents, Carmen and Dennis Marr. My mother Carmen uh, was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, moved to the city uh, when she was a teenager. She moved up to uh, Platakill and met my father, who lived in Newburgh. Was born and raised there. Uh, took care of his six, seven. I think they're seven younger brothers and sisters he came from a big family as well um, my parents did not come from a lot of money uh, but we had a lot of love growing up and they really kind of instilled my work ethic in me at a very young age uh, they didn't have to say anything to the point where i needed to know what i had to do i saw how hard they worked and it kind of inspired me to, to work as hard and get to where i needed to go as well in life what keeps me here is just there's no better place to live i mean i just love my home I went away to college a little bit, I've traveled a little bit, and I always come home. I'm a homebody, this is my community, and I see a family like Kristen's family and the uh, generations they've had here in the town, and that's something I would love to establish uh, with the Marr family. And my family was the first to move here, my parents moved here and they raised the five kids, and now I have my older brother Dennis, lives on Chandler Lane, my older brother Patrick lives off Berea Road. My sister Patricia is living on Oakland Avenue in Walden. I'm on Valley Avenue. My parents are on Ivy Hill Road in Walden. So the Mars are all over the town of Montgomery. Uh, we love it here. We're not going anywhere. And uh, I'm involved in politics because I wanted to have a, a say and, and uh, an ability to serve my community. I love what I do. And um, I'm hoping to continue that for a very long time here, working with people like Kristen and uh, community groups like Residents Protecting Montgomery. I think we're in pretty good shape. 
All right, thank you. I'm going to start off with some quality of life questions. I tried to com combine these, these little groupings. Um, and I think one of the number one quality of life issues that everybody is concerned about is the increase in development that's coming in front of the town. So first question, I'm gonna jump right into it. Ryan, what do you see the path is to a new comprehensive plan? And be as specific as possible with timeframes and dates. Sure, so at the reorg meeting, which is gonna be January 2nd, uh, it's my hope to discuss specific names that we wanna to recommend to serve on the comprehensive planning committee. Uh, Kristen and I have been meeting and I've been talking to other council members and council elect members to find out who we think would be good fits in terms of having a diverse group that could really put this plan together. I've also gotten a list of the individuals who have submitted me, uh, their names. I was one of those names, not knowing if I would be elected or not to serve on the comp plan committee. Uh, we have a really good base there. So I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot more to do other than to evaluate the names, uh, add a few to the mix, and really put together a seven to nine member committee that's gonna work over the next year, year and a half to put together a plan and a document that's gonna kind of dictate our philosophy on development, zoning, and so many other issues mm -hmm. for many years to come. With that uh, conversation um, around the same time, in the month of January, we are going to have a very well thought out, well prepared discussion on uh, having a development moratorium while we update our comprehensive plan. I think the go two go together. I think to a degree it was a slap in the face to the voters that it, it wasn't even discussed. I attended uh, most of these meetings over the last year and to be able to have that many residents come out and say this is an issue to not even discuss it, I think is why there is so much resentment and there's, there's some uh, issues in terms of the energy in the town of Montgomery against uh, elected officials you know, and those that, are, those that are sitting there. And for me, it's less about having animosity and it's less about the negative energy and more about channeling what we have to do moving forward. And my whole thing moving forward, and I know Kristen shares this, is being open, being transparent, and having conversations. You and I might not agree on every single issue, but we're gonna have a conversation. It's gonna be public, it's gonna be transparent, and people are gonna have the right to talk about it. Okay, thank you. Um, Kristen, what do you think the role of the town board is in the comprehensive plan development? I think it's huge. Um, when, I, when Brian and I were working or talking through this, um, I told them my interest is absolutely that the town board needs to be involved because we are the ones that are going to own it. This town board will, this will be our legacy because we are the ones that are going to do this comprehensive plan and we are going to finish it and we're going to get it implemented in four years. Like, I, absolutely as soon as possible, but I say four years because I don't want to do the campaign trail again. So <laughs> I say four years, this is my goal to do the, update the comp plan, update the zoning. Um, learning today that we also need to work through the water and sewer lines yeah. um, to ensure that our sewer plant has capacity and is able to handle um, any additional development in the area in Neely Town Road um, but I mean that's just the biggest thing is that we need to get it updated but the town getting back to your question the town board um, I submitted my name too mm -hmm. I was one of the people that did submit a letter and I think we absolutely need to be at every table where it's discussed to ensure that this is something that we can implement moving forward. Great. Um, going back to the moratorium, I'm sure you saw the newspaper article this week about the um, New Windsor supervisor elect who's sure. decided, he's also stated that he's in favor of a moratorium ASAP. Um, I know that in Montgomery, just having spoken to residents and attending meetings, we seen there seems to be a real phobia around a moratorium, around a lawsuit, and all of those um, potential outfalls. And I think a lot of that comes from the, you know, the history with the last comprehensive plan, which you spoke about in the last transition talk. Um, could, you, could you both describe the role that you feel that uh, the town's legal counsel has in these conversations as well? You wanna swap yep. who takes first? Go ahead. So um, I really think the town's, so the town's attorney is to, is to protect us. That's their role. Right now it's Blue mm -hmm. St. Shapiro and that, that, that. Um, but really, Will Frank does a very good job right now of protecting us, and specifically out of the group, I believe. Um, but having that conversation with him, but also ensuring not only are we protected, but we're meeting what our residents want. Because to me, the residents, which I say are constituents, because I think I've been on the lobbying side way too many years, um, but the residents are who elected us to make sure that we're protecting them. So we need to we need to listen to them, and I feel like we I have a good handle on what the residents have spoken, the residents have said at the various meetings. Um, but I think more along the lines, their job is to protect us, but we need to make sure this moratorium is going to meet what we want. 
Awesome. So, as per the rule for the town attorney, uh, I think Kristen's absolutely right. I think they're going to be vital, and I, I think at the end of the day, what's going to help us is that we're not the only ones who are considering a moratorium right now, and we're not the only ones who have passed moratoriums. We're not the only municipality currently that has a moratorium. Uh, there are development moratoriums all over the place, so we have the ability to look at their laws and see what worked, what didn't. When I speak about uh, having a moratorium with restrictions, I'm talking generally speaking. Most moratoriums have restrictions of some kind to protect from liabilities and lawsuits, which is something we're gonna work through with our attorney, past case study, and our own due diligence. Um, I'm excited about it, I really am, and it's gonna happen. If you want dates, I mean, that discussion is gonna take place in January, first thing. Ambulance Corps, moratorium, and the comp plan, those three things need to happen immediately, and we've been preparing for the last six weeks um, heavily having meetings to, to be prepared so that we can start day one. So there are a lot of projects that have, are there at various stages right now in the um, approvals process in front of the planning board, the zoning board of appeals, the town board itself as well. How do you feel they fall into this, the time frame for moratoriums? So we don't know. Uh, we both actually, I know Kristen asked a specific question on uh, one moratorium that we had it said it defined it as a certain point in the process mm -hmm. and we we need to identify how far in the process medline is how far in the process sailfish is and what that threshold is in terms of potential litigation right. and how real that threat is how real that problem is maybe it's not as much of an issue or maybe it is a serious issue uh, it's going to be part of our conversation to sit here and tell you i know exactly which ones and where they are in the process i don't mm -hmm. but i'm going to find out specifically before we have this conversation so that we're prepared so when the community asks a question, you know, if I don't have an answer, I have someone present at that meeting who could speak specifically to that concern. Uh, that's my job as supervisor to facilitate a conversation, to have the resources available, to maximize the conversation we're going to have for a positive result, and to make sure we don't just talk, right? right? A lot of times people get upset because there'll be a topic coming up on the agenda and we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk. Six months later, nothing happens. I want to bring people to a meeting if I don't know the answer to say, hey, this is the way forward. These are your options make a decision. And then as a board, we're gonna to have to make a decision with the facts that we have and with the public participation. And I was told, um, are you good? Yeah, go okay. I was told that, I was told by a business owner actually in the town of Montgomery, that that, that place that you can install, ensure that the project you know, did not pass go, right? Did not collect their $200 and move forward, um, is really when the shovel is in the ground. Mm. And I could say that both projects, while they have various levels of approval, are at various stages, right? Medline and Sailfish are the big ones, but there's also a whole lot of other warehouses in the process and, and other buildings. Um, not, they do not have that shovel in the ground yet, but in working with our town attorney, we need to determine legally where can we, um, where can we put on this moratorium, because if, if and, and how far, we have one more town board meeting. I'm just <laughs> saying, we got one more we town do. board meeting that more. we can get through and-, and It's the working session, right? Yeah, it so no public comment session. allowed. No, but well, you can submit letters. <laughs> uh, teaser, we're gonna change that at work sessions. Public comment should be whenever possible. Mm -hmm. It should be part of the participation in, in local government. When we had meetings at, at Village Hall in Walden, there was never a public meeting we had that didn't have public comment. So we should certainly allow it at work sessions and we're, that's gonna change going forward. But the, there is an actual moratorium law that we can work with our attorney to determine, mm -hmm. okay, starting January 1, projects are here. If we ins When we instill the moratorium, I say when, but as long as everybody else play, plays nice and we can do this. <laughs> Um, this is where we're going to put them. And, and, and this is what's going to be stalled. You're referring to New York State of moratorium. Yes. Guidance and law. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, we, <coughs> we aren't just two people having conversations with each other. We're engaging the other um, council members mm -hmm. and explaining to them what our arguments are. Right. Explaining to them the fact that Chris and I knocked on a lot of doors. I know how many I knocked on. I kept track. It was about 3,500. I know she was all over the place because we would often pass each other in the streets. I have a binder. Three pairs of shoes. So, <laughs> yes. So when, so when we, I went, I didn't go through any, but these Three are pretty bad. Um, but to, I say that because when we talked to Councilwoman Voss and Councilwoman Melick, and I talked to Ron as well, we're not just talking. Like we talked to a lot of people that represent Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and blanks. And especially among young people and seniors, um, there is 
a real feel that we have lost the character of our community and it's in danger of getting worse and worse. So mm -hmm. we have this challenge in front of us um, where we have to figure out revenue. We have to figure out rateables and we have to address the issue of overdevelopment. That's challenging, but I believe our residents are telling us that's what they want from us. Mm -hmm. And as people who just got elected by those individuals, we should respect that and at least make an attempt. And quality of life is huge for me. So I think one of the largest indicators of quality of life that we've been seeing lately is the traffic. Every time there's a back up under 84, everybody is exceptionally upset for good reason because it makes it difficult for us to just get to work, get to our homes, pass through the village of any of the villages actually. Maybrook, Walden has the same issues with, um, with 52 going through it and then of course the village of Montgomery. Um, until, until our comprehensive plan is updated, until our zoning codes are updated, um, and perhaps in conjunction with the moratorium, how do we ease people's concerns for traffic, for safety, for um, damage to our infrastructure from vehicles going over it that weren't meant to be going over it, larger vehicles, for example, um, especially considering our current zoning code has got a lot of kind of like spot zoning areas. We have a lot of uh, industrial areas immediately adjacent to residential areas with no buffers. Mm -hmm. How do we address that immediate concern right now? So did you start the last one or did I start nope, the last one? Nope, it's your turn. Oh, sweet. So just to give you an example, yeah. right? Um, we had the uh, accident on 84 mm -hmm. where we had basically, and I just learned this through that process, um, the state comes in and they say to the town, hey, we have a closure. We're going to access this route this way. And we need help in terms of making sure these trucks get to a certain place safely. And I said, well, why can't we put a plan together when we know this could, this happens and it could happen again, where we communicate with the state and whoever that point of contact is going to be, they know that those trucks should not come down 416 and 211 and come through the village of Montgomery, that they need to take that right, I know it's a tough right to take, and go back down Newly Town Road and take 84 and through it, take, uh, take that route to 84, as opposed to going through the village. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the question is communication, it's planning. And right. there is not enough of that happening. So specifically, communication, planning, and putting studies together. Those are the three things that I think we can tackle immediately to address those issues while we update our comprehensive plan and potentially have a moratorium in place. Okay. So not to add another layer of government to this because sometimes that bogs things down, but um, I, a resident in the village of Montgomery did show me a piece of paper that she foiled from the village mayor and it was requesting a traffic study right yep. so in the process of all this I hate to say the word study because oftentimes they sit on shelves and they don't do anything this was back from my soil and water tubs but I feel like a traffic study really could help us like where is the majority of the traffic coming from and where can we route that um, I did reach out to Senator Skoufis's office and I did forward that to him asking them to follow up on it sometimes DOT has a little bit more caring when the state senator's office calls and let's hope that they that. do <laughs> um but i i did i tried so that was my little two cents um but i fully get it i mean t making a left-hand turn out of browns road right before swim practice at five o'clock in the afternoon is rough i mean there's times that i definitely have to sit there for 10 15 minutes just looking both ways and waiting and waiting and waiting and I dread when sailfish comes in or if they come in, um, what's going to happen, you know, because all that traffic, it's great for them to say, oh, they're going to turn right, they're going to go down 747, or they're going to, their construction sequencing, stage six is also going to happen concurrently, so that way they can come off 747 and 17K, but just like the look on Karina's face, I don't believe it, um, and I really <laughs> dread it. So the only offer of hope that I can say is that I look forward to working with our police chief, Butch Amthor, mm -hmm. and determining what is the best route, what's the best way of sending cars and people. So, I mean, commonly, I see a lot on Facebook of, you know, this is closed, this is closed, this is closed. So maybe also creating a Facebook and staying up to date with the town, by the way, nominated you for that one. Um, so that's way we can be more transparent out to the general public. 
I don't know if that's possible, but we have to think of avenues to really get the information out to the people so they don't get upset and there isn't accidents and so, issues. So just to follow up on that real quick, one of my plans that I'm working on right now is to present to the board uh, the creation of social media platforms for the town, official mm -hmm. platforms for the town. That's going to be Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's going to be mostly informational. Um, and at the end of the day, I think to store and log meetings, creating a YouTube channel, things like that, that's something we ought to do immediately. Specifically, one more thing that is of added value to the traffic study is a lot of these, uh, the funding that's available are attached to whether or not you can provide statistics that come from a traffic study. Mm -hmm. So we need to have this data. We probably should tap into DOT for existing traffic study. And also in my conversations with the county, uh, I learned that you can work with DOT and they will actually help fund uh, traffic counts at certain intersections. And that could be certain, you know, that could be very advantageous for us, especially when you talk about certain mistakes that were made early on in the process when Dollar General came in, um, if things were done more appropriately, I think we would have had a traffic signal there. And hopefully moving forward, we avoid situations like that. Um, but that was that was a clear example of, of a lack of communication, a lack of fighting for something that was really important in terms of public safety to our community. So I'm gonna go off of the Dollar General situation. It's been my experience, my observation that the planning board is slammed. They've got at 40 to 60 projects in front of them at any given time. The town board is slammed. They meet twice a month. The meetings are, they don't, you mentioned this before, you, it, you, you can feel like there's, there's not a lot of time for them to get things done. They're only sure. meeting twice a month. They're not having a lot of conversations in between. Um, it's a virtually a volunteer position to be a town board member. I mean, it's, it's not like a super lucrative gig. Um, so people generally have got other things that they have to do on the side uh, that really should take, you know, president earning money to support their families. Um, how can we attack the many issues in Montgomery? You mentioned, you alluded to before to infrastructure issues. I'd love to talk to you some more about that later. Sure. There's a lot, of, a lot of plans in front of the planning board. There's a lot of citizens that have got things that they want to say, residents that have got a lot of important concerns that you need to listen to. Um, there's going to be a comprehensive plan, which is going to be a gigantic undertaking. Um, how how can the town board get all of these things done? I think that's a big concern for, for me and maybe for a lot of other people as well. Probably for you too. I have an answer, but I think it's your turn to go <laughs> first, right? Um, so during the candidates night, I think that the term on one of the questions was to serve. Mm -hmm. And that was a statement. So to me, when I ran, I knew I was serving the people. And yes, it's not a very lucrative job, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you get um, $5,200 stipend and um, the health insurance issue, which hopefully we're changing. Um, but anyway, to me, when I went into this gig, I knew it was gonna be a lot of work. And yes, I run the farm with my husband and our family. Yes, I have two little kids. Yes, I go to swim practice. Yes, I go to preschool twice a day. But to me, you make the time. Like if you, if you want something done, you ask a busy person because that busy person will always get it done. And we have to get this done. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of now or yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I, I can speak for myself and say that I am fully committed to making sure that these things will get done. And if not, he's gonna be getting a lot of phone calls and Cindy's gonna be getting a lot of phone calls and Cheryl and, and Ron of, hey, you know, we need to put this on the agenda. We're here, we're here, we're here. And really we've been spending a lot, like Brian said before, a lot of the six weeks. Anybody asked me, what'd you do today? Well, I was at town hall. And thankfully I have wonderful in-laws and parents <laughs> that watch my kids so that way I can go to town hall at least once a week, if not more often, um, to really become immersed in what's going on. Yeah. Because the more you know, and the more, the more you can move things along. Just so you know though, Mia has already picked out what toys she wants in the supervisor's office. So we certainly will allow her, uh, you know, the kids to come on over while we get some more Send done too. Send him So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, big problem that that occurs is availability i always say that the best ability you can have is availability mm -hmm. and i ran on and i spoke a candidate's night i spoke during my transition i'm going to be a full-time supervisor um the the compensation to be a supervisor at town of montgomery is fair enough where that is going to be my focus and i think working in the office 
Um, I think for the first few weeks it's going to be much more than nine to five, but that should be um, what people expect from their town supervisor, and that's what they can expect from me. And I think that's going to solve a, a lot of these problems because communication, I think, has been the missing piece for the last decade in terms of maximizing the potential of getting things done in the town of Montgomery. I, I completely believe that's been a huge part of it, and uh, I think in the future we're going to we're going to see that. All right. I'm going to shift gears. Um, it would be it would be real sloppy of me to not bring up the big news of the week, which is the town of Montgomery IDA and how it was featured in the report that um, Senator Scoopus and his group put together. Um, I wanted to get your reaction to the report, and I'm going to read a quote from the report first. Um, which so the report, um, if you haven't read the report, it's available on you can look. Do a search for Senator Scoopus IDA, a press release will pop up. You can download the PDF of the report if you haven't read it before. Or you did a post or on, our PM, on our PM. Because that's where I tracked document. it and read the document. True. Right. Um, and there are two case studies of issues. An IDA is the Industrial Development Authority, which is the organization that provides tax benefits to companies to, um, to support our local economy by bringing companies in or by facilitating business ventures. That's the idea behind the IDA. Um, Montgomery was one of two communities that was featured as, as a case study in the town. Um, and this is, this is what a highlight from the report. However, after months of discussions, Medline withdrew its application from the Orange County IDA after determining that working with the town of Montgomery IDA rather than the Orange County IDA would provide one-stop shopping and reduced cost. At the same time Medline's town of Montgomery IDA application was pending, the town planning board was considering the project's local approvals. The committee sought to ascertain whether one-stop shopping suggested there was a connection between local approvals and the IDA's consideration of financial incentives, a collaboration which would provide, which would prove unethical if not illegal. No parties that received a document request would or could elaborate on what one-stop shopping meant in the context of Medline's communications. So, Considering the interactions of the various boards, and in this Medline case, for example, the town board is evaluating extending water and sewer to Medline in order to make that development possible. Um, the planning board is the lead agency for the state environmental um, quality review process. Um, the IDA is the lead investor in the project. Um, before the application was withdrawn, they were dealing with, all of these boards were dealing with Medline concurrently. How do we manage and control the appearance or actual one-stop shopping that was referred to by Medline. And this is a, a quote from a Medline correspondence to the, um, the county IDA when they were explaining why they had withdrawn their county ID application and they were moving forward with the town. So how can we, how do we coordinate all of these boards? Understanding that you as town supervisor can't participate on all of these boards. It would be unethical for you to participate on the IDA board and it, it's just way too much on top of that. How can we set that that tone in our community to avoid this kind of appearance or actual malfeasance. It's really, it's really interesting, right? Because let me let me just piggyback on one thing you said. It'd be unethical for, for me to serve on the IDA board. We did have our supervisor you have in the past. serve in the past. Yeah. Many municipalities do that. And mm -hmm. I think in the report, they suggest that is a potential, uh, you know, legislative changes to have a representative of labor right. and representative of the school board, which would have the same type of conflict. That's true. So it's yeah. it's it's an imperfect situation, and you make the most of it, right? Mm -hmm. I think the issue uh, uh, for one stop shopping and that comment is a cultural reality in the terms of the business and how IDAs work. Right. And I think whatever legislative changes you make, you're still going to have people who have what is businesses worth tens of millions of dollars are going to look at a location and they're going to they're going to account and have conversations about what are the likelihoods and available subsidies that are going to be available before they they, they come so whatever legislation legislative actions take place conversations are still going to happen right so how do you solve the root of the problem i'll answer that within the town of montgomery idea you make changes and you can do that as supervisor because we have a say in certain appointments. Mm -hmm. And right now we have this amazing opportunity where they're looking to kind of change the way that their employee works. Right now there is an executive director vacancy for the town of Montgomery IDA. 
the last two EDs for the IDA, they didn't have an office. They were kind of uh, an employee that operated, whether it was home-based or in another office, with no real connection to the town of Montgomery, the supervisor, and how things were working. Constant communication between that employee, whoever that's going to be, the town supervisor, and the planning board will help curb a lot of these issues because there's not going to be a need, a need for individual conversations or promises to be made. We're going to write a set of rules, and we're going to say, this is what you get in the town of Montgomery. This is, this is what we provide. It's not going to be anything special or more, and you're going to know these rules. And if you don't want to come to the town of Montgomery, you don't have to come to the town of Montgomery. We have X amount of spots left, and we have to stop trying to give away the store. We need to value the land that we have left in terms of development and make it clear that if you're going to want a 15-year pilot where you don't pay anything in year one, you can go somewhere else. Because I believe, personally, that we should have businesses that want to be here and contribute immediately, and I believe they're out there. I believe those types of businesses are out there. So if we had a sailfish, oh man, sorry, I'm born and raised here, so I get a little agitated when I heard this. If we have so, so we have a business like Sailfish come in and say, we're not going to entertain a CBA and we'll walk. Guess what? See ya. I'm going to tell you to walk, you know? And I had a conversation with Sailfish yeah. and I said, I hope you don't get offended. I'm going to tell you to your face first, but this is how I would have approached that. And, you know, it's, maybe it's good for them that they got in before that because to me, we can do we can do better during the process to represent from a position of strength than we've been doing. And I don't think it's bad people. I don't think people are are nasty and they have you know ulterior motives to a degree. Some do, right? Some do. I'm not saying nobody does, but for the most part, a lot of these people care. They are just part of a process that's been moving and established for so long, doing it the same way that they that they just haven't made a change. So it's up to us to try to to make some of those changes. Can I get a shortened version of that question again? <laughs> that way I know directly what you're looking for. It really, how do you set the tone in the town of Montgomery so people don't think we're just open for business? By, to me, number one is the comp plan. Mm -hmm. Ensuring that that comp plan is going to have the restrictions in it that this is what we want. This is exactly, um, so it was interesting. I learned in one of my meetings, one of our meetings, about having a build-out analysis. If we build every single parcel that we have in the town of Montgomery, what's gonna be our traffic count, what's going to be our wastewater discharge, how many gallons per day do we need in our wastewater treatment plant, mm -hmm. how much drinking water, I mean, actual potable water, sure. yeah. um, farmland. So all these different things come into play and really just having good people on these boards. I mean, we That's have an opportunity good, now that there'll be several appointments available, so get your name in, um, send in letters of interest to I think they go right to the supervisor um, and oh. you'll advertise when those positions are open yeah. um, to ensure that we have good people on those boards that are going to ensure that it's not a one-stop shop um, because we, my family and I have been very active in the sailfish application and watching it progress forward and just speaking our piece. Um, and I don't really know. And I, and I want to address something because I know it came up on the RPN page and I mm -hmm. want to be as clear as day. I'll meet with anyone anywhere. I met with you and Don after the election. Mm -hmm. I met with Susan Cockburn literally an hour ago and I got her take on her how her transition went. I wanted to learn from her as supervisor what I could. Um, I met with, uh, I spoke on the phone on a conference call with Sailfish to get to know them. And yes, I went to 88 Charles Street and I met with Dimitri and representatives of Medline because I want to sit them down, look in their eye, and I want them to know where I'm coming from and what I expect out of the conversation moving forward. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's part of the process and I'm gonna be completely open in terms of, uh, of moving forward, what, what we're gonna do and what we're going to expect. Okay, um, I'm going to shift a little bit to future vision for Montgomery. I have some weird specific questions. <laughs> um, Kristen, one thing that few people know about you is that you are soils expert. And this is actually verbatim. Somebody submitted this question. Wow. Okay. Soil, please. particularly topsoil, is in its own way a micro ecosystem that takes years to recover once degraded. Is there a way to implement a means to protect this from damage when development projects, even seemingly environmentally friendly projects, are proposed, and how we can make this a condition of their approvals? So that's a loaded question. We're getting wonky. Um, okay, so my background <laughs> is. I worked for Orange County Soil and Water for nine years. Um, I am a certified crop advisor, both uh, nationally and internationally. That was one of the certifications that I hold. 
Not sure that makes me a soils expert, but I'm pretty good at it. Um, cause that is a 95% of the world. <laughs> that makes you an expert. <laughs> that yeah. makes you an expert. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, you know, it really depends on the development. Um, mm. What's interesting is in my time with the CAC, we got to review the projects. So I'll just throw this out there, a solar project, right? Um, oftentimes they'll clear the topsoil and they'll move it to one part so that, and they claim it's for development purposes. I'm not sold on that. Um, you know, I was just reading an article where a Massachusetts farmer, they put the solar panels up higher and the actual posts, they can drill them. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, look at the posts alongside 84, right? Those big ugly signposts, the new ones that they're putting in. You can pile drive posts from pretty high. So you, to me, you really don't need to clear that topsoil in those solar projects. You can pile drive those posts in, put the solar panels on top, and still farm underneath. People are doing it. Like I said, I read the, the article in Massachusetts. It might have been in Lancaster Farmer, but I'm not sure of the publication. Um, but, you know, and then, and then really trying to reduce the amount of um, impervious area on developments. So looking at their parking spaces, looking at their parking lots the size and scale of developments. I mean, I can ramble about this all day, but you really want to ensure that you can leave areas untouched because the natural soils and the natural ecosystems that's there will infiltrate the water, will filter it and infiltrate it into the ground. So it's less runoff that you have to deal with. It's less potential pollutant area. It's, like I said, I can ramble. I guess I am okay at this. <laughs> Karina, you're an you're a, uh, environmental person too, so she genuinely looks interested. I'm really but... curious about this answer. <laughs> I just zoned out to whatever you I think you can, you can really look at each individual development differently, but mm -hmm. having that right set of eyes on the planning board because, and, and ensuring that the planning board is listening to the CAC because the CAC does have very good people on it. Like, hey, Karina. Um, that's looking at these projects and valuing everybody's opinion in the process. Thank you. So get a crown, soils expert. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> soils Sultan. Um, you don't have a soils question for me. I don't. No. <laughs> you mentioned in your transition talk about the possibility for future businesses uh, coming into Montgomery. I think you actually referred to hover cars. <laughs> I keep getting made fun would... for that one. No, I'm a fan. Where's right, my cool. flying car? It would solve all of the pothole issues if we had flying cars. And the ice to shoot tonight. And the ice to shoot tonight. <clears throat> oh, that's funny. Um, what, what I'd like you to do is to do some like visioning for us, right? Okay. Like 30 years from now, 15 years from now, mm -hmm. your daughter's graduating from high school. That's less than 15 years from now. <sighs> Man, um, stop. I know. I'm aging you rapidly. Oh, my gosh. What <laughs> industries do you see in Montgomery? Like, where... You, you said in your last, in the mm -hmm. last transition talk you'd like to have a place for your children to stay here. Sure. For all of our children to be able to stay and work in Montgomery if that's what they want to do. Yeah. What kind of businesses do you want to offer to the people that are in your kids' class right now? I want to offer opportunity. I want to offer an environment where people who go to school here can create a different type of business or get into a field of their choice and not have to be forced to move out of the state and move down south and not have any contact with their family or their community. I don't know specifically what, um, in what group or what, what, what business it's going to be, but I know how successful communities have been throughout the country when the right environment is created and the right attention is given to the next generation and the right resources are offered. And I truly believe that if we offer the right type of opportunities and just kind of instill into our younger people that staying home is an option, building your business here is an option, and creating through the town support, through the idea support, through potentially the town chamber of commerce support, some sort of business incubator to give people opportunities and a platform to begin a business and talk about how they can stay here in the town, in 15, 30 years, you'll see a lot more homegrown businesses in fields that you wouldn't think of or imagine and that's the vision. I know it's not specific. That's why I joked about hovering cars because I couldn't think of something and I may not be able to, but hopefully 15, 20 years later, somebody looks at this video and there's a couple of niche businesses out there that we didn't consider would have been viable in Montgomery that are growing um, because we just don't know specifically what it's gonna look like. We just, I just believe in creating the environment where you can give them opportunities, allow for them to succeed, uh, allow for them to learn 
through the businesses that exist here, there's a lot of businesses up and down Neelytown Road that I think would have a lot more to offer the community if they were asked. I plan to ask. And potentially creating these programs, expanding the Town of Montgomery Youth Employment Program to provide these opportunities, that'll lead to, in, in the future, hopefully, homegrown Montgomery adults that are now youth building businesses here. I'm sorry I can't be more specific. I'm not going to go to the hovering cars. There's too many memes out there at this point on me already. But Really? Oh my gosh, my friends torture me every day. There's a new hovering car meme. I can't um, wait. Yeah. Um, my wife, I think, had the funniest one. So let me throw some. Let's, let me throw skeletons into this meme because sure. <laughs> what you're describing is is a framework or a skeleton, right? Sure. That people can build their future yeah. businesses on top of, and part and of that yeah. skeleton has to be sound infrastructure. Sure. So what what would you say your top concerns are with infrastructure that we need to tackle in the next five to ten years to facilitate businesses coming into Montgomery? Oh, man, you're giving him the easy one. That, that is an easy one. So specifically, so it's so funny. Kristen and I have been diving into this. Now we've been learning a lot, and we've been we've been educating ourselves on what's going on. We had a two hour meeting today, literally on this subject alone, and uh, we are getting sent to us an inventory with maps on what we have right now in terms of infrastructure. What are our issues? And the problem in the town of Montgomery over the last 20 years or so is there hasn't been a comprehensive plan for the future in terms of infrastructure, in terms of water, in terms of sewer, um, and we are going to establish that. So everything I said about envisioning and having the, the platform for people to grow businesses can't exist until we put a plan together now that we will see the success of 15, 20 years from now. Uh, so we have an opportunity to do that. We're likely going to be having a, a brand new uh, rehabbed uh, sewer plant, and that's gonna cost a, a lot of money. We're gonna have to put a plan together in, in terms of how we can afford that, but there's also a lot of potential revenue in terms of expanding our water usage and offering that both to businesses and also private entities. And that's revenue, which I actually learned today, that doesn't need to stay in a water fund that you can use in a general fund to invest in other uh, different things that we can do. Uh, I'll let Kristen build on that. So the biggest thing, um, wow, there's so much. So yes, you, you spoke on the wastewater and the uh, potable water, but there's also like building 112. Yes. We, need a, we need a home for our police department. It's, true. Um, it's really scary walking around in there and there is a lot of work to do um, within that building. We need to look at building 110, so the actual town hall itself, right? Yeah. Um, what's the insulation in there? What are our employees? speaking to the employees what are they dealing with every day are the bathrooms flooding which i hear they flood every week what's going on with the bathroom systems the highway garage i mean you can look i'm not an engineer but when i look up at the i-beam and you could see daylight through one of the main i-beams that's holding up the highway garage in the um in the bay that they wash their trucks that's a problem. I mean, granted, you don't see the, the sagging of the roof line, according to my husband that told me. Um, but the, the, the fact that you can see daylight through a main I-beam is, is really scary. It's not going to come down immediately, I, I don't think. But, um, you know, really looking into what the issues are. And we need to put them all together mm -hmm. and say, okay, we need a new highway garage. We need a new wastewater treatment plant. We need to... What about the money that we spent on the roof? Can we include that in? in um, and then making sure that the police department have a home. And and putting all these together and look at what kind of financing options we have. And while we're doing that, we're looking at our last audit and we're looking at the capital reserves and we're looking at where the funding is. On the campaign trail, I think you heard the number $9 million thrown out there. Like, it, like for, for some reason we had $9 million in cash, we don't. We have fund balances that are specific to capital investments that we can only use for that purpose. So as we're talking about these plans, we're also identifying what funding we have to offer, what we might need to borrow. The good news is, and this is to credit uh, those that came before us, is the town's finances are in good shape. Our bond rating is, is not you know, what it is in some other communities. So we have the opportunity to make these investments um, and build on some of the things that we want to do. But there's a lot of really big projects a that lot. need to happen yeah. soon. <clears throat> in addition to the, the building moratorium and in addition to the ambulance court issue. And yeah, fun. we don't want to minimize that. The ambulance court issue, we spent a lot of time on that one. I'm not sure if that's in one of your questions, but we've been, we've been working on that. And again, 
January 2nd at the Reorg meeting, you're going to see us take action on a path forward there as well. Not specifically a solution, mm -hmm. but um, it's not the second. Wait, it's the, it's the, is it the second? No, it's, it's the second. The second. It's the second. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking it was the fourth, it's but the no, second. the fourth I'm going to watch the uh, professional bull yeah. riders at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> so, so I just got the tickets today. So we're looking it's forward to we're looking forward to putting a plan in place uh, to to really capture not just the short term fix for the influence Corps, but sustainable mm -hmm. solutions long term to make sure that yes the town of Montgomery ambulance corps gets what it needs, but ambulatory services in general are we're serving our town the way we need to in case of an emergency. And I've heard that's been an issue for quite some time, it and has not just not us. Been a it, relative lately issue it's no. been a long-term issue yeah and all over the state not just us so in terms of that we also received a lot of questions that had to do with consolidation of services sure. and efficiencies across communities have you looked into those i know that you had um raised these questions before when you sure. were at walden yeah are, are there any opportunities for savings there are there just some things that are just too hot to touch is it my turn yep sweet so I just had a meeting. Um, I called Steve Newhouse, uh, County Executive, Orange County Executive, Steve Newhouse. He wasn't available, but his Deputy County Executive, uh, Harry Poor, who is an administrator in the city of Newburgh, someone I dealt with for Senator Larkin's office, I had him set up meetings with department heads of the county. So Dave Church, planning, um, civil service, um, uh, and every pretty much every single department we met with, myself and Sean Mears, highway superintendent, who's been doing a great job, by the way. And one thing that we focused on with Dave Church was shared services. Mm -hmm. And he informed me, and I did not know this, that coming this January, there are opportunities through Governor Cuomo's new plan where if you can show and you can put into an agreement shared services, you and one other public entity, could be multiple, could be just one, you just have to put together a plan for public services, you identify the potential savings and the state will write you a check matching the dollar amount in savings. And what alarmed me is nobody really knows about that from a municipal standpoint. So I was really happy I took the meeting because I didn't even know about that. Um, so I need to come uh, into town hall. And in our first department head meeting, I need to challenge all of our department heads to come up with concepts in each of their departments on shared services and say, I need in two weeks specific plans of anything you can think of. And also what helps is things that are taking place now from a shared services standpoint that have not been formally established. So we might be able to cash in on state incentives on things that we're doing right now to share services, but we have not put a put a contract together on. So being able to do an inventory and take advantage of that is, is important, but there are so many uh, financial incentives and grants out there for shared services, we're gonna look at everything, everything. And specific to consolidation of police departments, um, this is very sensitive to me because it's something I took on when I was a mayor in the village of Walden. My stance at the town is gonna be, in terms of working with the villages, I'm ready to talk whenever you guys want to make sure that this becomes an issue because in the town of Montgomery, it ought to come from the village. And if the village wants to entertain Maybrook, Montgomery, or Walden with me, any sort of consolidation talks, um, I would allow them to, to approach us and we'd be open to whatever it is that they want to talk about. I have not researched, while well, I have researched and worked with a lot of departments, I am not familiar enough with what are the hot buttons not to touch. I mean, I worked with the police chief a little bit, but there's a lot going on with the police department and housing specifically that I, I focused on where they're housed. Um, so I don't know enough about the individual departments as to what could be shared. Okay. Something I can work on in the future. Um, gut reaction, how do you feel about the 2020 budget? Oh. Yikes. So, uh, <laughs> for me, he said cut reaction. I know, I want to go so, so that's a really good question. I wasn't prepared for that one. Good job. Um, I view it as an opportunity. Okay. So for me, inheriting a budget is a challenge to work within it. Mm -hmm. um, it gives me a year to plan my own. So I think I'm set up in a, in a really good position. I think enough things that that I think are important to fund have been funded, and my hope is to stay within that budget. And while staying within that budget and while learning from our employees and figuring out what the needs are for the town to, to build up the 2021 budget throughout that whole year. So I think it's a great opportunity. Um, I think at the end of the day, we want to try to pay for services and not decrease services without raising taxes. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Is that going to happen? Who knows? But that's the goal. That should be the goal. Don't raise taxes. 
to maintain services, potentially add some new ones without raising taxes. That should be everyone's goal and to maximize every single taxpayer dollar, every single dollar. Look at it and say, how, are, how is, there, is there a return and how high is that return for the taxpayer on this dollar that's spent? So that's going to be my approach. Um, I would I echo that I would definitely stay within the budget and allowance. Um, with so much going on at Town Hall, with all the deficiencies that we've spoke about so far, with really all the work that needs to be done, I think it's doable. Um, I'm just concerned about in the future as things progress, how we're going to pay for them. But I mean, I'm sure. more of large scale right now, like millions and millions of dollars that we're not going to charge the taxpayers, right. but how do we get our projects done? So I think um, the last budget round that got finally approved by the town board was significantly better than the ones before it. I think it is a workable budget, um, but we need to stay within our means of uh, ensuring that we're still meeting what the residents want, as well as what we need to do to get done to continue to operate the town at the level that the residents can function. Okay. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so I want to ask just Diane, do you have any questions coming up online? Any comments? Or comments that we should... Keep going. Okay. All right. I'll ask the next question while she's double-checking that. Um, and no, my husband cannot ask when I'm coming home because I know he's watching this <laughs> and he was going to ask that. And I, I did rake the leaves before the first snowstorm. <laughs> Come home in trouble. <laughs> um, Wait, did they go out, though? Shh. Because I said, what if they're covered under snow? That really Leaves doesn't are count. are an important part of the soil biome, so you yeah, really no, should they're, be they're <laughs> I said, I, I the said about all of them. Okay. <laughs> dot dot dot. So I think another another group that often has really fraught budget conversations is, of course, our school board, right? Our school mm. district. Mm -hmm. um, what roles? What role and what intersections do you think the supervisor and the town board have in collaboration with the school board? And I want you to think kind of big, right? Because you're talking about creating. A framework of opportunity that has to be in alignment with what the students graduating from Valley Central are going to be prepared to do as they move forward. Yeah. Did you want to start yep. with this? And so I think um, really as we develop not to go back and I feel like I just constantly say this I probably say it in my sleep um, is really looking at that comprehensive plan because that comprehensive plan is going to say what do we want to be when we grow up what do we want to be what, what do we want to set the stage at for the future? And ensuring that our zoning also sets that stage for any student that wants to, you know, if Bailey wants to graduate high school and wants to farm, is there farmland available for her to farm? Um, ensuring that we're protecting our natural resources that we can't recreate in the future. But ensuring that the farm is viable enough to continue to be operated. Um, and this is just a very specific example. Is there industries? Is there going to be industries in the town of Montgomery? Yeah, but we need to make sure that those industries are a place where our skilled students can come back to. And I think our role with the town, um, being a town councilwoman, is really just staying involved in the conversations with the school. Um, I, I haven't in the, in the past I've just researched their budget and what they tried to pass it as a budget. But I have not attended their meetings, and in the future, that's probably another meeting that I should put on my calendar. Got a lot of meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, my whole thing is communicating on, on every issue. Obviously, I'm going to be in close communication with the administration. We have uh, policing issues. We have a ton of different um, issues. We still have the Dollar General Light, which is a, a chief concern that's going to be on our radar, I just spoke with uh, Assemblyman Brian Miller. He's going to be putting a call together with Senator Scoofus and State DOT and the school district and myself to get yes. an update on, on that one. That's going to happen the first week of January. And just, uh, like I said, these programs to tap into all the existing industry that we have in our town and to create employment and education and leadership opportunities for our youth and instill that pride in our community and giving it as an option in the back of their mind. Yeah, go away to college, but come home and creating that opportunity, that's a huge part of that is going to be communicating with the school district because they're the ones on the front lines. They're the ones that are going to be telling me what they need and, uh, and hopefully they'll be receptive to some ideas we have as well. And just quickly, I think we also need to work with the school district as residents, not even just as town council people, but mm -hmm. also as residents to say, you know, we, we understand that there's a potential of loss of schools, of students in the school districts. But you got to make sure that you're spending. We watch our budget. 
they need to watch their budget and make sure that they're not overspending in areas. And I don't know what their budget is. I haven't taken a look at it. Yeah. But, you know, if there's air, our, our, this, the kids' education comes first. Because to me, I'm a parent. I want my children to have a better life than I do. I think almost all parents do. But they need to stay within their means as well. Any comments, Dan? There was one specific to Medline. How do you feel about Medline VP asking Orange County Partnership to pack our pack meet, the room, the meeting to drown out our residents that our considered residents. unruly? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. How do we feel about that? I feel <laughs> that the Orange County Partnership should not be ruling our town. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if we put our comprehensive plan together and we set the rules in the town of Montgomery of how we want development to come in, the Orange County Partnership, the town IDA, all of these individuals, these organizations could become valuable partners. In the absence of a plan, they're doing what they think they need to do for economic development countywide within our town. So when we are able to dictate to them what we want, I think they could be a valuable partner. I think everybody who's in this business can be a valuable partner. Um, and if they're not, we won't talk to them. I want to list out, uh, this might help you out, I don't know what you're going to say. I want to list out the many different visions that I just brainstormed this afternoon as I was preparing for this. Um, Orange County has a comprehensive plan that identifies Montgomery as an industrial corridor. The Orange County Partnership has a plan to support that industrial corridor and to bring mega warehouses here because we're, we've got a tractor trailer on our town seal. Um, the we Orange County that? ID. We have to put our plan in first. So the Orange can, County IDA has got another plan again in support of bringing their their metrics of success are bringing in more businesses to Orange County. And if if Montgomery is the place with the lax zoning laws, the transportation corridor, the industrial zoning, then that's where gonna, that's where they're going to sit them. And then on top of that, we have each of the three villages mm -hmm. that are within the town that have their own Comprehend very plans. distinct com very distinct visions and also comprehensive plans. Um, that are, have either been completed or in the process of being completed. So how do all of those visions, how do we balance all of those visions? And beyond that, how do we overlay the town vision, mm -hmm. which theoretically will be developed through comprehensive plan? How do we convince all of these other potential partners uh, that they, they can be partners and not antagonists in our execution of our vision? Okay, so two things. Yeah. The first one, uh, answering their question, I think we can also look at who is on the boards for the Orange County Partnership, who is a board member, who is a trustee, who, whatever term you want to use, Balance for Alliance Growth, Orange County Partnership, these heavy hitters, we need to ensure that they are also not in appointed positions, right? I mean, whether they're engineers or attorneys, I do not think that they hold a, a spot in our town. Um, and I think looking forward, I will look at that in the future of, are there conflicts of, of directors to hold positions in our town? Because the second part of that is we're, we're a home rule state, right? I mean, we can say in our town, this is what we want. So I understand with the county, like I look at the county as the next level up. Yeah, they can be a great partner, like Brian said, with the shared services. But it's it, at the end of the day, this is what we want. And working with the, the other, the villages, um, you know, I just, I see them as a partner. I see them as a way that we can understand their needs because like you said, each one of the villages are different. You know, Maybrook's different than, than Montgomery, than Walden, but having the conversations and ensuring that everybody is kept in the loop, I don't foresee any issues with, with that part of it within town limits. Yeah, and for me as supervisor is communication. It's having regular meetings, whether they're monthly or bi-monthly with uh, each of the mayors and with other stakeholders within the town. As a village guy, as a village of Walden resident my whole life, uh, I think as a town, uh, it should be how can I support your vision? Um, there's gonna be certain developments that come in, like uh, for, for Sailfish, specific to the Timbrook, where we're probably gonna have a special meeting on water quality in the Tin Brook between the village of Walden and the town of Montgomery. Having these public debates and conversations and getting more educated ourselves and educating the community on some of the issues we face is going to be a good practice in communication and constantly getting buy-in to some of these things that you talk at a larger level. But it's going to start small. It's going to start conversation by conversation. And I personally cannot wait to get started and am very dedicated to making sure that happens. All right. We have one minute left. So lightning round. Oh, man. 
Great. Um, top environmental concern in the town, go. Uh, wastewater treatment plant. Timbrook. Okay. Top reason why people want to come to Montgomery as tourists, go. Quality of life. Yeah, quality of life. Okay. Top reason why our kids are trying to leave Montgomery right now, go. Uh, taxes and no jobs. I have no idea. My kids want to stay on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey wants to catch a chicken every day. I, 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 I talking, have nothing. I thought talking about in general and all, all kids, not just my own. I do know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was talking about Mia. There's a good chance that kids still want to come to my farm right. to catch a chicken. So all, so all kids want to come to her chickens farm. Chickens are pretty great. Though. Other kids can't find jobs in a tax. It's too unaffordable. Okay, and then the last one. Top reason why residents should keep coming to town meetings when you guys are in charge. To keep us accountable. To Absolutely. ensure that we are on the right track and to state their concerns to us and, and keep us surprised, or me surprised, I can speak for myself, of the issues. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, I said this, uh, when the Time Shot Record just called me and I said, the more the people are involved in their government, the more honest their government becomes. I saw that firsthand when I was in Walden, which one of the best things that we did in Walden came from public participation. Um, and I cannot wait to, to kind of change that tone at the town level. Um, and I'm going to announce specifically what I mean at our first reorg meeting, but there's going to be a lot more uh, back and forth. It's not just going to be public comment. I think a healthy exchange is a good thing if done correctly and with respect. All right. Thank you both. Thanks Thank for you, coming. Karina. Thank thanks you. Thanks, Walt, for hosting us. Thanks, Dan, yes. for videoing. And thanks, everybody who's been watching. We appreciate it. Thank Have you. Good night. See you.